please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, creator of all that is, donor of grace, and giver of life, hear our prayer. There are chasms in our lives, deep battles that separate us from one another and from you. We confess that we have allowed those risks to grow for fear of admitting our part in the separation fear of being rejected and be retailed. You call us to a reconciled life, to heal relationships, to a wholeness with each other and with you. Mend us as we pray and make us new creations through the power and love of Christ in whose name we pray. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, Get up. Take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to ask our young disciples to give me a moment of your attention, please. Um, the story in Scripture today is about uh, some people who were trying to get close to Jesus. And this is during Jesus' earthly ministry. So he was physically here on earth. So when they wanted to get close to Jesus, they just had to find out what home or what building he was in. He was in somebody's house. They went to the house. There were so many people, they couldn't get in the house, so they went up on the roof and ripped a hole in the roof and lowered their friend down to be near Jesus. Now, Jesus physically isn't on earth anymore. He died. He was buried. He 
was raised from the dead and he ascended, which means he rose up into heaven to sit with God in heaven. So if we wanted to get physically close to God, we couldn't just get up on the roof. We'd have to figure out some way to get to heaven. So what I thought is maybe we could build a heavenly airplane that might get us to heaven. So I've got a, I've got a plan. So let me see here. I'm going to fold this piece of paper that way, pretty straightforward. I'm going to take this corner and I'm going to fold it over here. Then I'm going to fold this way because we've got to have wings on our airplane. So I'm going to fold this over. I'm feeling good about this. I think this could work. I think this could work. Look, look at that. Pretty good. Do you think I can get all the way to heaven with this airplane? Let's see. Right. <laughs> Where did it go? There it is. Yeah. Let's try one more time. <laughs> That's not very impressive at all. I don't, well, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know that an airplane is really the best way. Maybe something else, though. Maybe instead of an airplane, I bet a rocket would be, I think, a better way. It's hard to tear this paper because it's folded over, but I think we can make a rocket out of this and have a whole lot better chance getting to heaven on a rocket than a silver paper set of airplane. That was silly to begin with. But look, now we've got a rocket. Maybe a rocket will get us there. Do you think so? Ready? <laughs> <laughs> That's worse than the airplane was. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think if we want to get close to God, we want to come close to Jesus. The only way is to come to the cross. For it's through the cross that Christ died for our sins that we might no longer be separated from him, but always be close to him here on earth and eventually in heaven. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks that you have not left us alone here on earth, abandoned, unable to be with you and to be close to you. Lord, we try so many things. We have airplanes, rockets, maybe working really hard to be really good. When the truth is, God, you've already given us the one way to come to you through the cross and receive you as our Lord and Savior. For for this we rejoice and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in affirming what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and ascended on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, as I mentioned to the young disciples, this is a passage where 
people were trying to get their friends close to Jesus. Now, it says that they heard that Jesus had come to this area. And it says that some men came bringing a man who was paralyzed. And it says that they wanted to get him close to Jesus. But it never specifically says why they wanted to get him close to Jesus. But they got him up on the roof, they tore a hole in the roof, they lowered him down, and Jesus saw the man, they, he saw the faith of the four men who brought him, and he responded this way, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now it says some teachers of the law, meaning rabbis or priests, were there, and they heard him say this, your sins are forgiven. And they began thinking, they weren't even saying it out loud, they were just thinking, why does this fellow talk this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they were getting angry. Now, it can be easy, I think, for us to read past this and kind of not really get why they would be angry. So I, I want to get y'all to help me with an illustration. Does anybody here have um, a $5 bill, a $10 bill, or a $20 bill that you would loan me this morning? Betsy, okay, let me just stay where you are and get that out. And I didn't say I prefer 20, but I'll take whatever. <laughs> Okay, let's see. I want to do social distancing. So. Thank you. We'll see. <laughs> Turn the paper around so you can get it. Now I signed, no, just turn it over for the writing. Now I signed on one line. Right above that is another line. Would you just sign your name on that line, please? It might not be cursive. That's okay. <laughs> However you want to write it is fine. Okay. Would you put your last initial uh, after your first name? Okay, thank you. Okay, so Betsy loaned me twenty dollars because I had asked if somebody would loan me twenty dollars, and she did. Thank you, Betsy. But then Mark Lambert signed this document that says, "Know all men by these presents." that on this day, July 19th, 2020, the year of our Lord, Pastor Mark's debt of $20 is hereby forgiven. <laughs> In witness hereof, the parties have caused their names to be assigned hereto by the respective officers thereunto duly authorized, all as of the day and year first written above. And it is signed by both parties. So, I mean, what started off as a very generous loan has now been forgiven. So, <laughs> that's it. Pardon? Not by you. You're not going to get caught up in details this morning, are you? Betsy, I mean, 
I have a signed document right here. Well, that's kind of exactly, well, could y'all accuse me of standing this person on purpose? And that wasn't my intent. I was just trying to draw an illustration. But that's exactly why the people in the tent, in the house where Jesus was were getting angry. Because just like Betsy said, that was her $20 that she loaned me. And she is the only one that had the authority to forgive my debt to her. And so when Jesus said to this man, your sins are forgiven, they understood the teaching of Scripture that our sins are against God. And so if Jesus was going to sit there in front of all those people and say, your sins are forgiven, then to them that was blasphemy. Because he was sitting in their presence and saying that he was God. And they could not abide by that. As, as they said, that was blasphemy to him, to them. But he was God. He was the Messiah. And so he had the authority. He still has the authority to forgive sins. Because when we sin, yes, we sin against one another. And we hurt one another. But ultimately, that sin is truly against God. So that kind of sets the stage in helping us understand why they were getting so worked up about this, why they were getting angry about this. But then notice, although the scripture doesn't say why the man's four friends carried him there and took him up on the roof and made a hole in the roof and let him down through the roof. It never says specifically, but just in reading the story, why do we think they were taking him there? To make him feel ill. Absolutely. They, they point out that he was, uh, his legs were paralyzed. Well, at least his legs. It doesn't say it could have been more. But they had to carry him there, so we can assume at least his legs were paralyzed, maybe more. And they lowered him down through the roof in, in anticipation of a physical healing. But yet, when Jesus sees him, and he saw the faith of the men, he said to him, what did he say first? Now, a little later, he says... Um, take up your mat and go home. But before that, what's the first thing he says to him? Your sins are forgiven. Now think of being in that man's place or even in his place of one of his four friends. Think of all the work they went through. Think of all kind of the chances and the risk they took. I wonder if when Jesus looked at it and said, your sins are forgiven, if they were like, yay! Or if they were kind of like, really? That, that's not what we came for. That, I mean, thank you and everything. We don't want to seem ungrateful, but is that it? That, I mean, really? So I think we're kind of at a point where one group most likely was feeling a little disappointment. Another group was feeling angry. And probably most of the other people were just feeling really confused at that point. Just trying to make sense out of everything that was going on. Think about this. And... Uh, you're a nurse, and I'm sure there are other folks here with medical backgrounds or at least have watched TV shows about uh, medical situations. 
The word triage. Are you familiar with that? Hey, just in layman's terms, man, what if you were doing triage, what would you be doing? Absolutely. So if you have a group of people, let's say being brought into an emergency room, you look at each individual person, you assess how serious their illness or injury is, and then you sort of prioritize. And the same could be true with one person. If one person comes in with multiple injuries, let's say somebody comes in and they're having a heart attack, but when they come up to the counter, they're clutching their chest, they're sweating, they're having trouble breathing, they're like, oh my heart, oh my heart, I've got this splinter in my finger. Oh, could you please get somebody to look at this splinter in my finger? You need to kind of triage that person and say, okay, I see the splinter, and we'll probably get to that eventually, but first let's check out what's going on with your heart. Because if not, you could get that splinter out of their finger only to discover they passed away while you were getting that splinter out of their finger. So just because there were multiple things going on didn't mean they were of equal importance. And what Jesus was doing here was a bit of spiritual triage. He looked at the man. It was obvious that the man was paralyzed. I think it was obvious to Jesus that the man wanted to be healed and that his friends who brought him there wanted to be healed. And the reason I think it's obvious, Jesus knew that the teachers, the other rabbis, knew what they were thinking before they even said it. So I think if he knew what they were thinking, we can clearly assume he knew what this paralyzed man and his friends were thinking. But what Jesus understood was that his spiritual brokenness, his spiritual um, separation from God was so much more important to be resolved and taken care of than his physical ailment. Now, please, I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that the man was paralyzed because he was sinful. That was a very common thought in Jesus' day and time, that if you had a physical ailment or difficulty, it was a result of your sin, specifically of your sin. And so I think it's clear here that's, that's clearly not what I'm saying. I don't believe that's what Jesus was saying either, because when he said your sins are forgiven, the man was still paralyzed. If there was a direct link between those two things, then when Jesus forgave his sins, his physical ailments would have been healed. But that's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus recognized his physical ailment, but he recognized the importance of his spiritual need for forgiveness. So often I think in our own lives, I know I'm guilty of this, things will be going on in my life and I'll be thinking, oh, if I could just get that job, my life, everything would be good in my life. Or oh, if I just could get enough money to pay off certain bills, wow, my life would be awesome. Or if I just had this relationship in my life that I see other people have and was missing, if I just had that kind of relationship, God, everything would be so wonderful in my life. I never need anything else. I'd never be unhappy again. And I think sometimes when we show to God with those prayers, maybe we wonder, you know, if what I'm asking for isn't that big. God, why can't you just do that? I think so often it's because God sees a bigger need in our life. God sees something else that's broken that needs to be healed. And if you're here today and 
you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I think this passage, along with many others in Scripture, make it clear that before anything else, that is something that you need to ask Jesus to bring healing into your life. To say, Lord, I can't keep trying to be good. Lord, I can't keep trying to be better and to be good enough and to earn value in your eyes because we already have value in God's eyes because he sees us as we are. He loves us as we are. He died on the cross for us knowing exactly who we are and what we are. And just calls us to see the gift of grace that is ours through Jesus Christ and to invite him into our lives as our Lord and Savior. So if you haven't done that ever before in your life, I just pray that today would be that day where you would receive Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. If you've done that, there may be other spiritual things that need to be healed in your life before that job comes into being, before that relationship comes into being. God sees your need for employment. God sees your need for relationships. But God knows if certain things aren't healed in our lives, a relationship is just going to lead to heartache and brokenness and loneliness. So instead of those things, God may be wanting to work on a different type of healing in our lives. I shared with y'all before about my son when he was younger, falling at his birthday party and busting his chin open on a table. He just split it wide open. You could see his chin bone in there and he cried and I rushed into the emergency room but again because of triage you know as a kid with a split open chin it wasn't even bleeding anymore it wasn't a heart attack it wasn't you know so many other things so we got triaged we kind of got put at the end of the list and I know we waited close to an hour and a half before we actually got to see the doctor well, in that time, I guess it stopped hurting. He couldn't see it. I could see it. It was disgusting. I mean, I couldn't stand the love. I couldn't, man, I could never be a nurse or a doctor or a nurse's assistant because I don't have the stomach for it. He couldn't see it. I guess it stopped hurting. So he was not concerned with it at all. And he just starts saying, Daddy, can we go home? Daddy, I want to open birthday presents. Daddy, I want cake. Daddy, I want, you know, all of his friends, his family. And he kept asking me, like, oh, I want my party. Let's go back home. And I could have done that. But I saw a deeper need. I saw something else that needed to be taken care of first in his life. Because if not, that could have gotten infected. And yes, he could have gotten his presents, and yes, he could have gotten birthday cake and ice cream, but he could have ended up back in the hospital, or if it had been ignored long enough, possibly even dying from infection. And so it's not that I didn't love him, it's not that I didn't want to give him what he was asking for right away, but there was a deeper need in his life that needed to be addressed first. And so when the man and his friends came and they lowered him down, we even see in the story that Jesus did eventually physically heal him. He didn't do it right away because he saw a deeper need, a deeper healing that needed to be addressed so that when he was healed, he could enjoy his life and enjoy it to the full. As we read these passages today, may we rejoice in the knowledge that the God we serve, 
The God we gather here today to worship loves us enough to give us what we need even ahead of what we ask for. That he sees a deeper need and seeks to bring out a deeper healing so that when it's appropriate and if it's appropriate, the things we've cried out for can truly be blessings and not stumbling blocks. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for loving us enough to see the real, true, deep needs in our lives. To bring about the healings that allow everything else in our lives to fall into place. Lord, as we pray and as you provide, may we rejoice in your wisdom and in your provision. And may it ultimately, Lord, be in our testimony of your love and your grace to ourselves as individuals, but also to a broken, fallen world. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of response is I Danced in the Morning, number 302. Please stand as you're able as we sing.
Christian giving is a responsive expression of our worship and stewardship of the gifts we've been given. I encourage you to continue to be faithful stewards of all that God has given you, to continue to bring forth God's tithes and your offerings as a part of your worship and response to the generosity of God. You can mail tithes and offerings to the church, Overbrook Presbyterian Church at 2605 Dumbarton Road in Rico, Virginia, 23228. Or you can give online by going to www.overbrookpresbyterian.org backslash online giving or scan the QR code on your screen with your smartphone. church militant to the church universal. Lord, we pray your arms of strength and support would be around them as they grieve and Lord would uphold them with the 
knowledge that through the life and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection, that those they have lost truly are not lost. Once they were lost, Lord, but now they are found. Once they saw only through a glass darkly, but now, Lord, they see all face to face. Lord, strengthen us and guide us with wisdom and strength and discernment until that day, Father, in your will and in your time, that we should be reunited with them and with you for your Father's throne. Father, we lift up all those who are separated from love one due to distance or illness or quarantine or restrictions. Lord, it's so difficult to be apart. But Lord, we rejoice that even though we may be prohibited from being physically with those we love. Lord, we rejoice in the knowledge that even now you are with them. That you are present and meeting every need. Lord, may we also recall and rejoice that it is the same Holy Spirit of the triune God that dwells in us, that dwells in them. And so, Lord, though the distance may be great, or the barriers may be strong, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, the ground between us is hallowed ground. Father, we each face challenges. Many of those challenges are challenges that we may never have faced before in our lives. Having to make decisions that perhaps we've never had to make before. Lord, with the things we face, we will not prevail, Lord, without your wisdom and without your discernment. So, Lord, pour out your blessings upon us and allow us truly to be the sheep of your pasture. Lord, your word tells us that you are the good shepherd and that your sheep recognize your voice and follow you. Lord, open our ears that we may hear your voice and give us the strength and the courage to follow you with all aspects of our lives. Father, hear us now as we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples to pray, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our sending him is old for a thousand tongues to sing.
may we rejoice in the knowledge that the God who loves us loves us enough to look into our hearts and to do some triage to see the healing that needs to take place even before what we cry out for is answered. Let us rejoice that we serve and worship the God of a greater healing, the greatest healing. So even though we may be at a point in our lives where we may be struggling with what we feel like are unanswered prayers, may we go from this place in the full knowledge and assurance that we go with the love of God our Father, with the grace and the peace that is ours alone in Jesus Christ, and in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. 